I want to say I appreciate Brother Colgill and it was interesting and uh, just the testimony of meeting Brother Colgill and, and uh, we, how, how we started coming to this church is really interesting to me and uh, I don't know who, I think my wife made the initial connection maybe. Uh, we, we've both made phone calls to pastors and this. But I was calling back Brother Colgill to, to confirm the meeting we had with him before we started coming to the tent meeting. And uh, and I didn't think anything of it. I just, just Pastor Stephen Colgill, I called him, and, and uh, he answered and said, Steve Colgill. And as soon as he started talking, I thought, why does he sound so familiar? <laughs> and then I thought, and then his last name hit me, Colgill. Wait a minute, I know this guy. You know? And uh, I got saved back in 1990, I believe it was 1990. I don't know the exact date because I was in my bedroom alone. Nobody had a Bible. Nobody told me, hey, mark down the date, write it down. You got saved this yeah. day. You know, I wasn't in. I just know that when I laid my when I laid my head on the pillow that night, I knew I had trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Yeah. And I knew it was over. And uh, but I got involved. I met some Christians and they invited me to this camp called AMOC that was out in uh, Lake Ontario in Rochester. And I came the first year, I came to the altar and just, I just cried and cried over the fact that I had come to the knowledge of the truth. But I didn't even know what truth was, you know. What is truth? That was, that was kind of my life. I just, you know. But the second, it was either the second or the third year, Brother Colgill was at that conference. And this was 30 years ago, right? 30 years ago, something like that. See, it would have been, if it was 92, it would have been 30 years ago. And, uh, I said, I still remember the message you preached there. I said, I, I mean, never left left my mind. He preached on Stephen, and, or I mean, on, on Paul's uh, when when he stood before Cain Grippa and he talked. He preached the gospel, and he and he basically was uh, explaining to Cain Grippa how he's being falsely accused and this and that. And he said, I would. Uh, Cain Grippa said that. Uh, uh, I, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian, and Paul said, "I would to God that thou wert almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds." And I remember he put his hands up like this and said, "Except these bonds," and that never left my mind because it never really clicked until I saw that that Paul was in chains while he was preaching. Yeah. You know, and you think about things like that. You really got to get the context and the picture of what's really going on sometimes yeah. in these stories that we read and. And, and and just how these people just love God, amen. Man. And uh, but anyways, Brother Colby was a was a blessing to me, and, and it was just neat that the Lord reconnected us like that. And Man. so we've been coming for eight or nine years. What a blessing, Man. amen. I appreciate you, brother, and your spirit and and uh, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And, uh, I like that, and it's an encouragement to me. So Second Corinthians chapter six and. And uh, we're going to look at verse 14. I'm going to read verses 14 through 18. Let's we'll start out with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us, and thank you for the opportunity to be here yet another year. Lord, I pray that you would be with my lips and help me to communicate. Lord, some of the one of the harder things sometimes for me to do is to communicate. Lord, we can get truth from your word, but Lord, uh, giving it to other people, Lord, is a whole other step. I just pray that you would help me to Say the things that are pleasing to you, Lord, to expound your word, and Lord, the Holy Spirit would just have his way. And Lord, I just thank you for your forgiveness, and Lord, I just thank you for the grace of God, and I thank you, Lord, for the precious blood that we shed to forgive us of our sins, and Lord, thank you that our labor is not in vain. Lord, we can go out and tell other people about you and know that uh, we're doing the work for you, Lord, thank you for that. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you be with the message tonight and the remainder of the service, and Lord, uh, the remainder of the meeting. And we'll thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, I'm going to read down through there. The Bible says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell with them and walk in them. 
I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord. Paul is talking to the book of Corinth or to the uh, church of Corinthians here, and we know that the church of Corinthians was a carnal church. Yeah, yeah. And Paul is rebuking them for that. Yeah, yeah. And we have a problem in this country of worrying about what the world thinks about you and I. Yeah. The Bible says that we're supposed to be separated. <laughs> We have a problem with separation in this world. Yeah. And, and uh, a Christian, when I when I got saved, I was taught a lot of things about separation, and I just I was thirsty, I was hungry, I wanted to know what God wanted me to do as a Christian, and a lot of it had to do with separation. Yes. But nowadays, nobody wants to talk about separation. Nobody wants to talk about what a Christian should look like, what a Christian should do, and, right. and how they should uh, walk with the Lord and, yeah. and be separated. Yeah. There's no... Uh, Jesus said, if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Yeah. Don't worry about being separated from the world. That's we're always The world is going to disagree with you and I as Christians, yeah. period. Amen. So, and, and, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, I have a lot of... Uh, good Christian men in my life that have been influence, uh, an influence on me, and some of them have changed a little bit. And you know, they'll say things to me, and it's like, and they'll get me to question things. Yeah. And then after a while, it's like I start reading my Bible, I'm like, why am I even questioning that? What in the world are they talking about? That doesn't even make any sense. Yeah. yeah. This this is what makes sense. Yeah. And it's clear. It's concise. I don't need to give that the time of day. Yeah. Uh. Now, I'm not saying, now here's where, where we do need to change. We've got to make sure we're not mean spirits. Yeah. God didn't tell us to have a mean spirit. Right. But he did tell us to preach the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And if somebody thinks that the truth is mean spirited, well, that, we, can't, we can't worry about, you know, we can't worry about that. Yeah. We do have to correct ourselves. You know, yeah. it's, e it's easy to still get in the flesh as a Christian <coughs> because you're upset about something and... Yeah. You know, and then you're you're just doing what everybody else is doing. So we just have to be cautious about that. But there's no reason that we have to be worried about separating from the world. And so tonight I want to talk about seven characteristics of a Christian. And I'm going to go back over to Psalm chapter 51. And I wanted to start out there because Paul makes it very clear that you and I are supposed to be separated Christians. Yeah. We're not supposed to live the way the world does. We don't we don't do things the way the world does. We don't look at ourselves with, like Aaron said, you get up in the morning and you look at yourself and you should be seeing uh you have a new man, you have a new nature, right? But you have an old nature. <laughs> we have to get up every day and say, You're gonna die today, old nature. I'm gonna live for God. You know, if if we walk in the flesh. Uh, we're going to destroy ourselves. We're going to, you know, uh, implode. Yeah. Uh, Psalm 51 says, <clears throat> so seven characteristics of a Christian. So if you want to define what a Christian is, and, 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 and this is just seven characteristics, but there, there's a lot of things that a Christian ought to be, but I'm just going to talk about seven tonight. Yeah. The Bible says there, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. First of all, a Christian spirit. The spirit is going to have a Christian is going to have the spirit of a con of confession. Yep. A true Christian spirit will see his sin as dirty and unclean. He will see a need to confess it and forsake it, to repent of it. And the world, the unbeliever, will defend his sin. Yeah. He will go on in his sin. He does not even acknowledge God's opinion of it. Yeah. So you and I are different right, right from the onset. Yeah. Sin is dirty to us. To the world, sin is not dirty. Amen. And he will defend it, and he doesn't care about God's opinion of it. And in most cases, he just is going to go on and, and, and you know... I think sometimes the world has a remorse, but the Bible talks about worldly sorrow. We're not supposed to sorrow the world. It's worldly sorrow. They just don't like the effects of their sin, but they love their sin. They love their sin. Amen. But a Christian doesn't. A Christian spirit doesn't love his sin. A Christian spirit hates his sin. Yeah. A Christian spirit wants to have victory over his sin. Yeah. 
someone who wants to follow the Lord wants to have a victory and wants to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. A true Christian understands that sin separates from God and that concerns him. Isaiah 59, 1-4 through 4 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, and your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath mu uh, muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. You know, if we as Christians don't have a spirit of confession, we're going to go on in our sin, and our sin is going to separate us from God. A true Christian spirit is going to be a spirit of confession. That is a characteristic of a Christian. And when you get stuck on your pride and you just continue to go on in your sin, and, and maybe like what I was saying about just keep thinking about yourself instead of falling on your knees before God and confessing that sin to Him and allowing Him to clean you up and, and cleanse you, then you're getting into more of the spirit of the world, spirit of this world. The spirit of a true Christian will see his sin as wrong and an offense to a holy God. He or she will have a repentant heart toward God. He realizes that going on in sin, or she, will only have an adverse effect on his or her walk. Talking about being defeated, and parents being defeated. What good does it do to get out and get away from God? That's just going on in your sin. That doesn't do any good. That's not going to help anybody. We need to put, the, right? Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, I press forth unto those things which are before. Anybody that's holding on to the past is never really going to have any true victory in their life. Yeah. The past must be in the past. The modern church tries to lead people to believe that living in sin has no effect on your Christianity because God's love for you is the only thing that matters. You know, God loves you, and I've heard this said before, God loves you just the way you are, but God loves you so much He doesn't want to leave you that way. All right. Because you're just going to destroy yourself. You know that if I didn't trust Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, if somebody didn't come to me and hand me a gospel tract and tell me that I could know for sure that I'd have eternal life, I, I almost could guarantee I wouldn't be alive today. Yeah. Guarantee yeah. the road I was going down. Amen. Why would I want that choice? I mean, thank God. Yeah. Thank God yeah. <laughs> that He delivered me from that. Before I caused too much destruction. 18 still seems kind of young. But I'll tell you what, between 15 and 18, I, I made a mess in my life. Yeah, and so it can happen fast. Yes, sir. But I thank God for Christians, and I thank God for those who tried to give me the truth, share truth with me, and I thank God for the Holy Spirit of God who comforted me and tried to change my life. Even before I met Christians, I, I was convicted about things I was doing because the Holy Spirit was trying to comfort me and, and lead me in the way everlasting. And then I want to say second, one of the second, brother, I didn't even pay attention to what time I started the year. What time? Let's see. All right, well, just stop me if I'm going too long, but I'm going to try to get that. Uh, second characteristic of a Christian is the spirit of truth. A true Christian spirit tells the truth, and he loves truth. An unbelieving and worldly spirit loveth and maketh a lie. The book of Revelation tells us that, uh, that, that they love and make a lie, those that uh, are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Men of this world do not even think twice when they lie. They will lie at the drop of a hat to protect themselves and their sin, they will lie their way to the top of the company ladder. They will lie themselves into upper political powers and influence. They will even try to lie to God yeah. himself. But God knows the truth. And the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Right? Yeah. So, you see, it doesn't matter what excuses I come up with. If God says to me, no, I know what you are. I have to say, you know, Lord, you're, I surrender. Yeah. I surrender. Help me be what I need to be. Yeah. 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 Amen. Blessed are they that do his commandments, 
that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I want to say tonight that we are separate from the world. Yeah. There's no reason to worry about being part of the world or being more like the world to reach the world. That philosophy does not work. Amen. It doesn't work. Yeah, we need to love people where they're at. But we don't have to be at all like the world. Don't worry about being pure. Don't worry about following God wholeheartedly. Don't worry about being more holier than now. You know, you hear that. You're, you, all, you, all, all you Christians think you're holier than everybody else. And no, but I know God isn't holier than everybody else, and I want to follow Him, so if that makes me holier than other people, well, whatever. Yeah. You know, you can perceive it whatever way you want, but I'm going to follow God. Yeah. And I'm not going to let you be an influence on how I'm following God, because God. you don't define it for me. The Lord does, and His yeah. Word does. Yeah. Amen. A true Christian has a spirit of charity, and charity rejoiceth in truth. 1 Corinthians 13, 6. It says it rejoiceth not in iniquity. Christian, you have a problem when you start enjoying iniquity yep. in somebody else's life, on TV, yep. in your own life. That's a that's a thermometer. That's a problem. Amen. You start enjoying iniquity. The Bible says rejoice is not in iniquity, but rejoices, rejoiceth in truth. You know what? A spirit of charity is going to rejoice in truth. Yeah. A spirit of charity is going to rejoice that somebody gets up and said a, says a man's a man and a woman's a woman. Right. Yeah. Because it's truth. Right, yeah. You know, they're not going to rejoice in the iniquity. They're not going to take pleasure in that. Never. It doesn't matter what men say. It doesn't matter how, you know, it's, it could get rough, you know. It could get, you know, I mean, I get concerned for my kids and, yeah. and their, and, and their yeah. children and the, our grandkids that are coming into this world with what they have to face and stuff. And, man, you know, God's going to have to step in. I'll tell you what, God's going to have to step in. If he's going to tarry for any length of time, there's going to be some times God's going to just have to step in and deliver our kids. Yeah. Because we're, we're, we are going down a, a slippery road as a country. And changing policy. Change, sound familiar? The Antichrist, what does he do? Change policy. That's what he does. And he makes things that are wholly illegal. Yeah. Right? And he's making things that are unholy legal. Yeah. Yeah. And not only making them legal, but giving them civil rights. Yeah. Oh boy. Right. That's a big problem. Yeah. That's a real big problem. If, yeah, I mean, I know some of the terminology there, but if you don't really understand how big a problem that is, you should study it out a little bit. Uh, that means you can't say anything against them, is what that means. Right. Or you're going to be breaking the law. But we have to give the truth, amen? And I'm not here to discourage anybody, but I'm going to say that we can't be like the world. We can't worry about being separated. And we have to have the spirit of truth. Thirdly, a Christian character is the spirit of liberty. The Bible says there in verse 12, look at verse 12, it says, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Thy free spirit. David asked, David said, I need the spirit of liberty. And 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Now I'm going to define this liberty passage, because this is what all the liberal Christians want to look at. Liberty. we got liberty, liberty, liberty. This is liberty from man-made laws and forms of religion. That's what liberty is talking about there. He's not talking about the liberty to sin. God has never given anybody a license to sin, ever. And, and you know, God can't contradict himself. He can't say something's wrong one time and then say it's right another time. God doesn't do that. But this liberty freed us from the bondage of the law. Yeah. Amen? Because if you study the passage there, there's people trying to bring them back into the bondage of the law. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thankful for that liberty. I'm thankful that I can go out to breakfast with Brothers Colgill and order bacon and ask for a well done and enjoy eating some bacon. Amen? Amen. Uh, we're, that's the thing we're talking about here. We're talking about meats and feast days and different things that they used to have to observe and, you know, trying to get people snared in all those religious doctrines. But we've been calling them liberty by the blood. And I, hey, I'm not saying, you know, uh, there's Amish people around us. I want to witness to them. I, want, I think some of them are saved. We've talked to some of them, several of them, 
You know, some they don't need to necessarily get out of there. I call it culture. They can be saved and be in it. They can be saved and be in it and try to reach their families. That is until their families say, no, you got to get out of here. You don't agree with it. But they can, you know, there's nothing wrong with living that culture. But that culture is not going to get them to heaven. They're free from that bondage. That's the liberty that Paul's talking about. He's not talking about the liberty to sin. So we're, we're, you know, a true Christian spirit is going to have a spirit of liberty. You know, it's a blessing when you go into places and you feel like you have the spirit of liberty to preach, yeah, to talk, yeah. to say, you know, whatever God said from His Word. We were talking about that today earlier too. You know, if somebody said, you know, I don't want you to talk about this and talk about that, or, well, that's not really the spirit of liberty, is it? Right. Amen. And uh, of course, we want to stick to the Bible. Amen. And then fourthly, I want you to notice in verse thirteen. That God is uh, a true Christian characteristic is going to be is going to give you the spirit of effectiveness. In verse thirteen, it says, "David said, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee.'" You know, a true Christian is going to have the spirit of effectiveness. Yeah. You know, sometimes you may not always see the fruit that of your labors, but we have to believe the book, Amen. Yeah. And the Bible says. That uh, our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Yeah. You may not see the fruit, but you're going to be effective. You're going to be effective. There's things, you know, there's people that come down years later that I didn't know. I mean, I, I, I had one particular situation, a place I worked and. This guy was reading all kinds of books on Darwin, and, and he was an intelligent guy, and I, I worked on the same press that he worked for a while, helping him. I was just a, a helper, but I was excited about the Lord, so I'd get in little debates with him and everything else, and we'd talk about this and that and every other. He was a nice guy, but completely stooped in evolution and Darwinism and reading books on it and everything. And I, you know, he, he left. He went to work somewhere else, and I didn't know what happened to them, but uh, I, our church used to have a yearly uh, Christmas thing that they would put on, and I was handing out bulletins one day in the church, getting ready for that, because people were coming in the door, and here comes Jerry through the church doors. And I thought, is that Jerry? Is that, is that Jerry I used to work with and talk to him? He used to read about Darwin, and, and uh, he came up to me and he said, first thing he said to me, hey, Dave, how are you doing? I said, Jerry, what are you doing here? He's like, I got saved. Hey. Just like that. And he was so excited. And he said, isn't it great? And I thought, hey, man. And I thought, man, it is great. Yeah. And I thought, you know, you just never know what kind of impact. And I don't know how he, I don't even know his testimony completely. But all I know is I was rejoicing yeah. at the fact that he yes. came to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. And he came through that door and said it was great to be saved. Yeah. And he wasn't reading Darwin anymore and evolution and all that junk. So you never know what kind of impact. I don't know what kind of impact I had on him. You know, I probably said a lot of things I didn't even understand back then. You know, I remember street preaching uh, one time, and I told some guy we were in some debate, and he don't even know, but so he doesn't know whether I told him the truth or a lie. But I said the Bible says there's no atheist in the foxhole. And then I, you know, I went on some other things. And man, I was all. You know, proud. I thought, man, this is good. You know, and got back, and one of the guys I was going to Bible Institute says, man, that was great, Dave. You did a great job debating with that guy. But I just had one question. I said, oh, yeah, what's that? He said, where does the Bible say there's no atheist in the box? <laughs> but you know what? That's a zeal without knowledge. You know, sometimes I think God just winks at that stuff. You know, he corrected me because he said, the Bible doesn't say that now. you got to get that right because... It doesn't say that. You can't keep going talking about things about what you say. You know? But anyways, uh, but you know what? A true Christian spirit is going to be a spirit of effectiveness. You are going to have an impact on somebody's life, as Jonathan said. Your, your pen, your testimony, your epistle is going to be seen by somebody. So make sure you're setting a good example. Because people are watching you and you don't even know who, who, who it is. Now you can have somebody over there that's quiet in the corner. You're not even recognizing. Don't even notice they're there. But they got their eye on you like a hawk. Yeah. Yeah. And they're just waiting to see. 
and you know they're not necessarily waiting for you to fall, but they're watching you. And that and your life may have a, an effect on that person. Jude 1 22 verse verse uh, uh, Jude 1 22 and 23 says of some have compassion making a difference. We're supposed to want to make a difference. As a Christian spirit, you're going to want to make a difference. You're not going to want to run away from people. You're going to want to make a difference in somebody's life. Amen. And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Yeah. You know, we went door knocking yesterday, and I, some of the people that were coming to the door, I'm just thinking to myself, my Lord, what are these people? are just yeah. How on earth are we supposed to help these people? Yeah. I could just give them truth, that's it. But they're a mess. Yeah. As little kids like this. Yeah. It's like, how do you straighten this out? I mean, God's got to do something. Yeah. But these people are, they're going to hell in a basket. And no doubt. And, uh, but we can save some, amen? Yeah. Yeah. We can have an effect on some. We have to look at verse 15. I want to keep moving along here. Verse 15 uh, uh, a characteristic, fifth characteristic of a Christian, a Christian is going to have the spirit of praise. The Bible yeah. says there in verse 15, O Lord, open my lips, thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. You know, you, you can't be a true Christian and not praise God. Amen. You're going to praise the Lord. An unbeliever in this world's spirit does not praise God. They hate God. And they want you to hate God. And they don't understand why you love God. And they don't understand why it's foreign to them. Why? Because the Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, neither can he, for he is spiritually discerned. Yeah. Do not expect the world to understand your life. Amen. They will not. You understand your life. Because you know God. They don't. So we don't have to be the same. Psalm 22, 3 says, But thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. You know God inhabits praises? It's interesting. God, God, you know, God commands you to praise Him. Amen. Music is, is, God, is of God. God wants you to sing yeah. to Him. Yeah. You know the Bible says, Be not drunk with wine or His excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, yeah. singing and making melody yeah. in your heart. Yep. Amen. God wants you to praise him. A true characteristic of, of a Christian is going to be the spirit of praise. A true Christian will praise God. The Bible says in Psalm 111, 1, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Psalm 117, 1 and 2, Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God that he's going to sit on the throne one day, regardless of what anybody else is saying. Amen? Yeah. And, and, and Amen. man, you know what? The Lord said if, th if these didn't cry out, the rocks would cry out. One Amen. day everybody's going to be praising God. Whether they want it or not. Yeah. They're going to realize how good a God he really is. Yeah. And number six, the uh, characteristic of a Christian is the spirit of brokenness. Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. We are going to get hurt. We're going to get, we're going to fall. But God expects us to get back up. Yeah. Amen. Come to Him with that broken and contrite heart, and He'll take care of it. A true Christian spirit is going to be broken before the Lord. A broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. A true Christian spirit has very little pride in it. Although it may seem like pride, a true Christian spirit has very little pride. You know, there's a great difference between pride and confidence. There is a great difference. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and I, I was uh, somebody was I was I don't I don't know if I want to say being trained or whatever. I can't remember the, all the circumstances there, but there was a particular individual that uh, I know a lot about printing. I mean, I'm 20 years into printing. I've been a printer for 30 years, and uh, there, there was a time I was being uh, t talking to somebody about printing and presses and chemistry and all these different things, and uh, the guy said to me, he's like, you think you know everything. And I I just want to say this. When I, the, the knowledge that I had and that I was giving him was knowledge I did have. 
And I didn't know, you know? And uh, I said, well, I, I don't want to be pride, but I do know a lot about this subject. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with being confident. Right. Yeah, yeah. You got to be confident. I got to be confident to do my job. Right. Yeah, I'm going to run a press for 100,000 impressions. I want it to run right, so I need to know why it's not running for 100,000 yeah. yeah. sheets of paper, right. you know? Yeah. And, uh, and that goes for any uh, area of expertise. You want to be the best at what you do. Yeah. And you get knowledge. The Bible says that his children are destroyed for lack of knowledge, yeah. right? You can have confidence. In God's book and in the knowledge of God. That's a different, there's a big difference between that and pride. Amen. Somebody who's prideful thinks he knows something that he doesn't really know. Yeah. That's pride. If you don't know something, don't act like you know something. Amen. You know, I, I remember asking, I used to ask the guys all the time, what's this? What's this? What's this? Finally, I went up to a press and I said, I'm sorry, I'm probably asking too many questions. He turned around and he looked at me and said, the only dumb question is the one that's not asked. Yeah, it's the only way I can learn. Thank you, yes. I'm going to ask questions. If you don't know something, ask a question. Don't act like you know it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's pride. Yeah. But that's not confidence. And many times over, Paul said we could have confidence. Right. We could have confidence. Yeah. I know. Uh, Brother Ralph asked me just a couple weeks ago. He said, do you ever doubt your salvation? And I, I'm not, I mean, I know people doubt their salvation, but I said, honestly, with all my heart, no, brother. I, <laughs> thank God. I just, thank you know, I wasn't saved out of a religion or anything, and I just never have turned back. I don't doubt my salvation. Amen. The Holy Spirit came in to stay. Yeah. And I, I just know what he did in my life. You know, I mean, there's no doubting that God turned my life around, that he entered in. <laughs> you know, my friends before I even got in church were asking me what was wrong with me. That's the Holy Spirit. I mean, how do you, you know, I can, well, anyways, my point is, is I was, I'm confident that I'm saved. Amen? Because the Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Yes. Amen. And the Catholic will look at you and say, yeah, you can't know. Nobody can know. Yeah, the Bible says you can know that. I can have confidence in that. You know what that does for me? That helps me understand the love of God. Yeah. If I couldn't have confidence in that, I wouldn't know the love of God. I wouldn't be able to serve Him the way that we serve. Right? Paul said the love of Christ constraineth us. That's what should constrain us. I know sometimes we go through the beauty. Of the, but man, that ends after a while. You just keep going through the motions. Finally, you just got to get on your knees and say, Lord, I just need you. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can only go through the motions for so long. Yep. The love of God's got to be what's constraining you in your life. Amen. And so the Spirit broke us. And lastly, I want to say that uh, verse 18 and 19, look there. Uh, the Bible says, Do good and thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build out the walls of Jerusalem. Then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness, with burnt offerings and with whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer the bullock upon thine altar. I want to say that the spirit of a Christian is going to have the spirit of righteousness. A true Christian spirit is motivated by God's goodness, and a true Christian spirit will rejoice in righteousness and true holiness. Amen. True holiness. He loves righteousness. He loves godliness. He loves purity. Yeah. He wants to see his kids go to the marriage altar pure. He wants to see them not fall into the world and get damaged by the devil and broken and tore up and ripped apart. The Bible says that your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's exactly what he is. And he will take no prisoners. And he will have no mercy. He will not fight fair. It doesn't matter how much you think he's going to fight fair. He'll allow you to think he's going to fight fair, and then he'll come from behind. Because he doesn't let up. But I thank God that we have somebody greater than him. Because yeah. the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yeah. Jesus Christ is greater than the spirit of this world. Yeah. We don't need to be like the world. Yeah. The spirit of the Christian is a completely separate thing than the world. Yeah. My God. Psalm 5.8 says, lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness. Why? Because of my enemies. Make thy way straight before me. You know how that's important for us to pray? Because the world is trying to confuse and twist everything up. Yeah. But God, please make that way straight before me. Because yeah. I want to walk in the path of righteousness. 
Not the path of unrighteousness. Psalm 9 8 says, And he shall judge the world in what? In righteousness. In right, not unrighteousness. People are going to look at God and say, Hey, you said you loved us. Well, I also said this was sin. I also said this was wrong. And I also said to forsake. I also said to confess and forsake it. And what about all that stuff? Yeah. <clears throat> so you can then walk with me. See, it really does go back to self. They're just more concerned with self and their life than they are with the relationship with right. God. Yeah. Psalm 23 3 says, He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name. So, listen, God will never lead you into sin. Mark it down. Right. It doesn't matter. You're, you're going into sin. It ain't of God. Right. It's not of God. He didn't lead you that way. Right. Guaranteed. And I'm going to end with this. The conclusion tonight is the characteristics of a Christian are separate from the characteristics of this world. And the question for all of us tonight is are you separated unto God? Or do you find yourself falling into the clutches and the spirit of this world? And I think we all do at times. The spirit of this world only brings confusion. The spirit of God brings clarity and a straight path. Amen. And we need to walk on that path. You know, Romans chapter 8, I, we did a devotion not too long ago out of Romans chapter 8. I was telling the kids, listen, you got a choice. You can either walk in the flesh or you can walk in the spirit. Right. And as a Christian, we all have that choice. Yeah. But if you choose to walk in the flesh, you shall die. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to be living for the Lord. You're not going to be rejoicing in God. But if you walk through, if you do through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. Amen? Amen. And the suffering that's talking about at the end of Romans chapter 8 is the suffering that you put your flesh through yeah. because you're mortifying the deeds of the flesh so you can walk in the Spirit. Yeah. We have a choice. We're not of this world. <laughs> Be not you know, one of my favorite verses I learned as a new Christian was, if a man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Yeah. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen. That never changes. Amen. All things just keep becoming new. <laughs> Paul said, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are before, I press forth into those things which are those things that are in, in front of me. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I'm losing my train of thought there. But my point is, we are separate from the world. Let's yes. focus on the Lord. Let's walk in straight paths and let's put that stuff behind us and go Amen. forward yep. for the Lord. Amen. He'll forgive us, but we need to understand it is sin and go forward. Amen. Amen. Amen.